Could somebody please tell me what's wrong with hitting back at the bad guys? Why the omnibus crime bill isn't ominous tonight on The Source. Why are the chattering classes so hostile to the Harper government's omnibus crime bill? Okay, I dislike all omnibus bills as abuses of parliament. And while I'm happy this one didn't criminalize hyperlinks to hate or allow star chamber style terrorism interrogations, harsher minimums for growing pot than child rape sound more like the effect of taking drugs than fighting them. But the basic point of this long complicated bill is to increase punishments for doing bad stuff. And that's good. Unfortunately, while it makes most regular people happy, it apparently further convinces the smart set the masses are too ignorant and bloodthirsty to realize punishing wrongdoing is not merely barbaric, but vulgar. The bien pensant's first line of defense is to claim crime is down in Canada. The press loves StatsCan's annual digest of crime reported to the police that claims crime is declining. But here's just one table from Scott Newick's debunking McDonald laurier Institute report, and it shows the violent crime rate is up four times since 1962. In any case, I think the statistical argument is secondary. There's a deeper revulsion here to the notion of hitting back at the bad guys, expressed in the Globe and Mail's Thursday editorial cartoon. And in interim leader Bob Ray denouncing the bill for taking the country in an ideological direction because of an obsession with symbolism instead of real public safety. Mind you, Bob Ray's definition of an ideologue is someone who holds their opinion after hearing his. But he's far from alone. There was the usual uproar from the usual suspects saying the money would be better spent tackling root causes of crime like, quote, poor mental health, addictions and child poverty, end quote, or providing public housing. But NDP Justice Joe Colmartin really let the cat out of the bag, sneering that the Tories, quote, ideological bent that punishment will deter crime flies in the face of absolutely all the evidence. Likewise, my former citizen colleague Dan Gardner threw a fit in print this morning, essentially restating his 2003 claim that, quote, there is abundant evidence that most criminals are neither aware nor rational, end quote. And ace criminal lawyer Clayton Ruby said 11 years ago that, quote, this idea that if you increase the severity of sentences it will somehow solve the crime problem is really amazing to anyone that knows history, end quote. Among other things, this argument is a slander on criminals. After all, the rest of us weigh costs and benefits in everything we do. Not always accurately, of course, but before, for instance, buying a house, we consider how much it would cost versus how nice it is, how nice the neighborhood is, whether it's a convenient location, and what else we could get for the money. Indeed, the whole of economics is built on the assumption that people react to incentives. To say criminals don't is to say they are not really people like us. They're not sentient beings making choices. They're things propelled about by forces, and we should propel them about with other forces instead. I'm also tempted to slap such arguments away on the grounds that they're so stupid I don't really believe the people making them believe them. Would Ray or Cobarden repeal environmental or hate laws, or even the gun registry, on the grounds that punishment doesn't deter crime? Who doesn't know that bank robbers are less likely to try to pull a job if there's an armed guard outside? Of course deterrence works even on stupid people. That's why John Locke said in 1690, In the state of nature, each transgression may be punished to that degree and with so much severity as will suffice to make it an ill bargain to the offender, give him cause to repent, and terrify others from doing the like. Exactly. An ill bargain to the offender. I don't deny that the typical criminal is stupider as well as nastier than average. My weekly CFRA Radio Ottawa Sun Top 5 Strange Stories feast on criminal idiocy. Clearly most criminals are unreasonably egotistical, lazy, and bad at considering the future. But that only means punishment has to be swifter, sterner, and more certain to get their attention. Punishment isn't just about deterrence, of course. But that just makes things worse for opponents of getting tough on crime. For instance, only the willfully obtuse deny that putting bad people in prison protects society because while they're in jail, they aren't out committing crimes. Did you know Clifford Olson was arrested 94 times before launching his murder spree? If stiffer sentences could not have scared him straight, and they probably couldn't have, they could have kept him off the streets where he snatched his victims. And by the way, the fact that prisons punish people for misbehaving when behind bars is further proof that deterrence works. Bleeding hearts are a bit more sympathetic to a third reason for punishment, rehabilitation. Now that can mean counselling and training in prison, but it could also mean smartening people up with a swift kick in the rear. 
In any case, I don't think it works as well as sociologists claim. It's far easier to change the incentives criminals face than to change the way they react to incentives. Now we come to the fourth reason for punishment, which I think gets to the heart of the debate. The basic moral and legal principle that the punishment must fit the crime. This notion, sometimes called retribution, is not utilitarian but metaphysical. A British jurist once said, even if you could prove a one shilling fine deterred murder, it would be wrong to punish murder with a one shilling fine. Come what may, justice must be done. Consider the United Press headline when Nazi leader Hermann Goering swallowed poison right before he was to be hanged for war crimes. Quote, Goering cheats death by committing suicide, end quote. Look, he didn't cheat death, he died. He also didn't elude punishment by a higher tribunal. But he did avoid being put to death by his fellows for having placed himself in an implacable state of war with them. And he and they understood that in doing so, he was cheating justice. As William F. Buckley was said, executing a murderer vindicates the dignity of the person whose life we did not manage to protect. Thus, even firmly anti-capital punishment Israel introduced the death penalty just in time to hang Adolf Eichmann in 1962, then dump his ashes in the ocean before abolishing it again. Retribution has its limits, of course. We could never properly punish Clifford Olson, first because he would deserve whatever torment we could devise unlike his innocent victims, and second because we could only kill him once. He should still have been hanged, though. Bottom line, punishment works, and that's enough reason to support it for normal people. But in the widespread revulsion among elite commentators, I detect not just stupidity, but a deeper revolt against the whole concept of justice, an attempt to deny the existence of moral choice by refusing to impose consequences for bad ones. But morality exists whatever they say. That's why people who commit violent crimes should get jail, not house arrest. It's why people who break parole should not get it as easily next time, and it's why Clifford Olson should have ended his days at the end of a rope, not in a hospital bed.